Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. Hey, bosses. This is Johnny, and welcome to episode 263 of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. Today, I'm with best-selling book author, Expat Secrets on Amazon, Michael Thorpe from The Escape Artist. He's also the host of the Expat Money Show, and he spent more than 20 years traveling around the world. He's been to over 100 countries, including Colombia, North Korea, Zimbabwe, and Iran. His goal is to help people generate additional streams of income, eliminate their tax bills, and to take advantage of offshore structures so they can travel the world freely and never have to worry about money again. Welcome to the show. Hey, Johnny. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to join your podcast and hopefully share a little bit of knowledge and maybe inspire some of your guests today. Yeah. So we had a chat a few weeks ago on, on your show and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, you know what? This guy sounds super interesting. And I wanted to know more about you because obviously on uh, the the interview you did, uh, you heard about my story. I would really like to hear about yours, starting with kind of where did you grow up and where are you from? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born in southwestern Ontario. uh, So I'm Canadian. And when I was a child, I was probably grade three. And um, the teachers and the resource teachers and the principal, they pulled me aside. They pulled me out of class. And they told me, Mikkel, Mikkel, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is we want to send you to a special school, a special school for special boys. Basically, I was, I was diagnosed with a learning disability when I was a child. So that's what they did. They sent me to a special school. And every day for three years, I got on a little white bus and I took the little white bus across town and, uh, and went to the special school. But the problem, Johnny, was that it actually was not a special school. It was a regular school with a special class. So you can imagine. I got in fights. I got picked on. I got bullied. Um, It was a horrible experience. Now, this is no woe is me, pity, Mikkel, I'm a victim. Certainly not. I I gave as good as I got. I got in a lot of fights and, you know, I scrapped back for sure. But um, I really didn't like school at all. Like, I just, I, I, I truly hated the experience. So... Grade seven and eight, I finally got to go back to my neighborhood school. I was so excited. I was so happy. And, and I thought, oh, you know, all my friends, they're going to have missed me these last three years. They're going to be wondering what happened to me. And, you know, they're going to be so happy to see me. It's going to be wonderful. So I, I went back and, you know, people start to gossip and they whisper. And, oh, I remember him. I remember Mikkel. He went to some retard school. You know, 1980s, oh. totally politically correct. Kids are super sensitive, very sweet and nice, you know, some retard school. So my problems in school continued and grade seven and eight, I started failing and then they'd send me to summer school and then I'd fail summer school and then I'd stop going and then I got into high school and then stop going to high school and stop going to class. And basically by 12 years old, I just, I just stopped going to school and by 15, I dropped out wow. and, um, not shortly after that, a couple of years later, I started traveling internationally and I started meeting these incredible people, Johnny, these people who were doing things so differently, who were learning differently and experiencing the world. And they were out there like taking risks. And I was like, wow, these are my people. And they didn't know about my past and my learning disability, which by the way, is a form of dyslexia. Like it's really no big deal. I've gone on to be um, a professional author and i edit a magazine and wrote a book and have a popular blog that gets read, um, read about 3 million times a year. So, I mean, what they said in school and the principles and stuff didn't really matter in my life. Like I went on and proved all of them wrong. But what I really found was that the, that there's not only one way to learn things. I mean, when I started traveling, that was my education, that, that was my high school and college and masters and PhD and everything like that. I just learned in a very different way. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. It's, um, I, I feel like a lot of us are, are kind of in very similar paths, you know, and not, of a, you know, not all of us went to, uh, had to go to a different school for it, but a lot of us felt like tr- the traditional school model, learning model just wasn't for us for whatever reason. And escaping, you know, and traveling has really allowed us to kind of reinvent ourselves and you know, kind of close those, uh, those doors. And I think, you know, if we stayed in that small town or the city that we grew up in, we would be judged on, you know, what we were like when we were in middle school or high school. Mm-hmm. Now people just care about, you know, what have we done lately? Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. I mean, to blame a to blame an adult for what they did when they were seven years old or something that was out of their control, it's a little bit ridiculous. But I, I do think that you're 100 percent right. And people do get blamed or, or they have very long memories or still make fun of people because of something from back then. And it's like, it's not really fair. I mean, let's judge people on their actions as of today. And people work hard to make themselves better, either through personal development or in our case, travel. You know, I think those are yeah. important things. Yeah, I almost feel like even on the the positive side, I think every 10 years, we should kind of reset things we've done. You know, even if somebody was a, a sports star in their 20s, if they're 40 and out of shape, you know, they can have those memories and enjoy it, but they can't really still cling on to that, that you know, that that uh, stardom because it's a bit sad. Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly, exactly the same where, you know, if we were doing stupid things in our 20s, and now we're in our 30s or 40s. As long as we're good people today, we should kind of just let that go in the past as well and not blame other people for what they did, especially when they were, you know, literally a kid, when they were seven years old or, you know, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I agree. Yeah. So when you started traveling, was it just for fun or like, and where did you, where did you go? Yeah. So my first trip, um, I was a teenager. I went to Ireland, England, and Wales. I actually used to compete in Team Canada for martial arts. So that was my fir very first trip. And then that was with my father. And it was interesting because, you know, he had traveled when he was, I don't know, I want to say 23 or 25 or something like that and had backpacked around Europe. And he had always told me my entire life, like travel was the greatest thing he ever did in his life. And I was like, well, I didn't get it. You know, well, first of all, I didn't get it because I'd never traveled. But then I didn't get it because I'm like, if it was the greatest thing you ever did with your life, like, why didn't you do more of it? Why did you only do three or four months of backpacking through Europe? Why didn't you go on and on and on and on? But anyways, I went with him on this trip and, you know, we were gone for just under a month and it was unbelievable. Like I had never seen these types of things or met these types of people, you know, and that was unbelievable. That was like 16 or 17. And then um, and then I came back to Canada and started saving up more money. And then I was like 18 or 19. And then I went to Europe by myself. So I went, I flew into the UK and I was in the, the UK for a couple of days, then France and Holland. Belgium. Then I flew down to Spain. And then by this time I was kind of running out of money. So I went to North Africa and then I spent two months in North Africa and uh, went all through Morocco and took a camel. It was really funny. Took a camel from Morocco to Algeria, uh, three days on a camel to the border with Algeria and then mm. came back and we were like camping in the Sahara. It was crazy. And then was in Portugal and all over Europe. I don't know, but it was, that was about five months. And then wow. from there, it so, was like, I was hooked. It just went on. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> so when you went in North Africa, was it just because it's way cheaper than the UK? Like how, how much were you spending out there? And, and how, where, where did you get this money? Did, had you had saved up from a job or something? Yeah. So that at that point, because basically I left school when I was quite young. So during the summers, I was working in a farm, picking the weeds out of bean fields, which is literally the worst job ever. Um, and then I was like babysitting and then I started working in a grocery store. So it just kind of saved, saved, saved from about 12 years old on. And, you know, my parents taught me delayed gratification. So my, my, what I did at the beginning was save and then travel, save and then travel, save and then travel. Eventually I figured out how to, you know, make money online and travel at the same time, but that came quite later on. And that's why I'd never really considered myself like a digital nomad. I consider myself an expat. I, go into one country or community or culture, and then I'm there for a couple of years. And I use that as the base, and then I travel out from that. So, I mean, we can talk about that, or we can go on with some of the other travels, but I mean, I've been at this for 20 and, years, so I've done a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, I think that's more of what I what I do now. I, and I think most digital nomads are slowing down now, too, where mm -hmm. they'll have a home base, and Every you know three six months or something they'll take a trip somewhere, but then they'll come back to their home base. What made you like this style more than you know living out of a backpack and continuing to move? Well, because I guess because I did do the backpack thing for quite a while. So like I said, I was in Europe for five months uh, the second time around, and then I lived out in Western Canada in the ski resort. So I was mountain biking all summer and skiing all winter, saved up money. And then I hitchhiked and backpacked through Central and South America for 18 months and didn't work. So I was just constantly on the move. 
And that was exhausting. Like that was so tiring. It was amazing, especially this was early, early 2000s, like 2003 or something that I was doing this trip of hitchhiking and backpacking. So, I mean, we didn't have the convenience of like, like the internet existed, but it wasn't like it is today. Like not even close, like forget about smartphones or, um, you know, having a laptop with you or anything like that. Like I was using a film camera to take my travel photos. So I think I did like a lot of that type of travel. And then I was just kind of burnt out after a few years. So I moved to New Zealand and I lived in New Zealand for a year and then used that as a base and traveled all through there. And then I lived in Australia for three years. And I think that's kind of when I developed the hub and spoke model, as I affectionately call it. And from Australia, I traveled out to like Fiji like five times and I went to Vanuatu and Tonga and I was really big into scuba diving, um, which I know you are as well. So, I mean, we chatted about that before too. And yeah, kind of grew. Actually, it was not like one thing. It just organically grew my, my style of travel. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it takes people some time to figure it out where, you know, yeah. the first couple, couple of trips, people do the package tour and then they realize, hey, why am I getting, why am I paying four times as much as I would if I just did on my own and I'm forced to just get pushed around. Let me go do it on my own. And then they realize, okay, there's, you know, some people like it faster. Some people like it slower. Some people mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. trains or, you know, every, everyone's a bit different. So definitely encourage everyone to figure out what your style is and don't just get, you know, thrown into the, <laughs> the package tour, especially. Yeah, absolutely. But I guess for me, I did a lot of the fast travel at the beginning and then slowed down and then just, I didn't slow down so much, but I've kind of found my pace. But I guess for me, it's really a cultural thing. I like to really get to know a place and the people and the food and the language and stuff like so in a lot of the countries I've been to, I've spent whatever the maximum of my visa was. So I might spend, you know, four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks or, or a year there, you know, and really get to know the place and then move on. Um, that's worked quite well for me. Uh, I like that style of travel. And I guess also, yeah, I, I think know that's really that smart. I'm going to be uh, at this for, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's brilliant. I think a lot of people don't realize that it's a, uh, it's kind of a waste of time and resources to, you know, go somewhere for two weeks and leave, especially if your visa is still valid for another, you know, X amount of days or weeks. People never factor in the, the costs of moving around or the plane mm -hmm, ticket. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, they figure like, oh, I, I can't afford this cheap flight. But I think of it more as we have our whole lives to travel. So why rush? You know, why not take advantage and really get to know each place? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I started telling people when I was a teenager that I was going to go to every country in the world. And they looked at me like I was absolutely nuts. Like they thought I was so crazy. Now at 21 years straight of travel, um, I mean, and visited more than half the countries in the world. I mean, I don't get those same types of looks anymore. It's just, it's not if, it's when. And, you know, I'm 37, about to be 38. I'll be at this till the day I die, which inshallah will be, you know, when I'm 100 or something like that, or 120, hopefully. And... I got a lot of time to do this so I can take my time and spend two months or six months in each country. I got no problem with that. Cause this is not a, it's not a race. Like I'm, this is not a competition. I'm it's not a sport, you know, this is just my life. This is how I live my life. So have you ever thought about settling down or, you know, picking a place, whether it's in Canada or somewhere else to spend the majority of the year? No. <laughs> Short answer. No. I mean, like I said, I lived in, New Zealand for a year, Australia for three years, Singapore for a year. I lived in the Arctic for 366 days, lived all over Canada. I lived in Guatemala. I lived in the US. I lived in the Middle East for eight years. Um, now I live in Panama. I mean, I thought, I thought Abu Dhabi was home. I mean, I liked Abu Dhabi quite a bit, but the place changed and, you know, it felt like time to go. And so we left, you know. Do I still feel a little bit homesick for Abu Dhabi? Yeah, like I'll, I'll be honest, I do. But I never, I never planned on staying there forever. Um, you know, I, I did really like the. You know, that's a good point you mentioned, where places change, mm -hmm. and th there's no reason to cling on to staying somewhere just because it used to be great. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, for example, even Thailand for me, I loved Thailand. That I felt like that was going to be my my home or the place I would go to. Uh, every winter for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. but you know they just gotten more and more strict on on rules and regulations and visas. 
uh, the they're kind of trying to phase out scooters and uh, street food, like the kind of wow. the two things I loved most about Thailand. And I've realized, you know what, Thailand is changing, and there are other options in the world. So I can try to kind of cling on and complain about everything that's missing, or I can just move on and find the next Thailand, which is always up and coming. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And there's so many countries out there that look at other governments, other nationalities, other other places, and they're like try to figure out what they're doing right and how they can attract entrepreneurs and digital nomads and location independent people. So there's always new programs coming out, and I mean that's really exciting because I think that's how governments should behave. I think that you know human beings are not slaves; we're customers, and if they treat us like customers, then we'll go to the place that's going to fit us best. And I think that's really, really important. And I, I actively work with organizations and I'm starting to now be contracted by governments to help develop some of these programs. I do consulting for this type of stuff. So I think that's really exciting things and it does give me hope for the future. Yeah, and definitely in 2020, there's been so many new visas and programs to attract remote workers. In mm-hmm. fact, our last four episodes have been you know, about various programs. You know, we had Mita talking about Barbados's welcome stamp, Mr. Nomad Numbers talking about Taiwan's uh, gold card visa, um, Mike uh, Swig talking about WC Georgia's, um, you know, remote worker visa. I mean, it really 2020 has accelerated this online, uh, you know, income welcome stamp in, in so many countries now. Yeah, absolutely. I've been writing about these things on uh, on the blog at escapeartist.com since the very beginning. And I think that these are amazing opportunities. Now, not all programs are created equal, that's for sure. But it's good that there's more programs and hopefully the, the best programs will rise to the top. They'll be the most popular and the other ones will have to be more competitive. Yeah, you can definitely see that. So you're living in Panama now? Yeah, we moved to Panama about 18 months ago and it's amazing. We're in Panama City, right downtown. I've got a beautiful two-story penthouse apartment right over, locking, right over the park overlooking the ocean. And I mean, we pay less than our small apartment in Abu Dhabi. Crazy. And in general, what is the, the cost of living in Panama? Super cheap. I mean, okay, it's, it's not as cheap as some of the other Central American countries, which I've been to all of them, a lot of them multiple times. Um, it's probably the, I, I would guess it's the most expensive. Maybe the only one that would be comparable would be the islands off of Belize. But... It's really affordable. And you have to understand Panama City, although although Panama is considered a, a developing country, like Panama City and, and large sections of Panama City are fully developed first world countries, like first world infrastructure, everything you would expect. We go out for Michelin star restaurant quality dinners. Um, we go out to bars and have fancy cocktails. There's three cinemas that are walking distance from my house that all have VIP so we get the huge chairs and a blanket and I push a button and someone delivers a beer to me. It's awesome. But I mean, the cost is maybe one half to one quarter of what you would pay in like Miami or something like that. Yeah. And, and the amount of freedom that you get, you know, being there versus being somewhere like Miami or in Canada, you know, especially with what you can afford, uh, you know, and be able to buy back time. I'm, I'm sure, yep. you know, things like having a maid or something is, is way cheaper than it would be in Canada or or in Florida. Yeah, I have an assistant who helps me around the house. You know, he goes to the bank for me. He goes, stands in line, does things, or we send him out for errands. You know, he helps out just around the house. I pay him double what most people would pay in this country for hired help, double. And it is still so affordable. And he's super happy because he can support his family. And, you know, he's become like part of my family. I mean, we've had him since literally the day that we arrived and you know if i have to run out i i get him to watch my kid you know (laughs) like i totally trust him and i mean we're helping drive the economy by being in this country and can do things like this like i couldn't have a full-time assistant that worked in my house if i lived in canada i mean that would be way too expensive and the house wouldn't be big enough to warrant something like that but here i can so i do yeah it's funny that you know, growing up uh, in North America, the idea of having a butler or assistant or live-in maid or a cook or a driver, it just it was ridiculous. It was something that you literally would see in movies or Freshman's Bel-Air. 
but living in a lot of these countries, I mean, here in Sri Lanka, especially with the kind of the, the British um, influence, it's very normal for villas and houses to have servant quarters where people live full time. Mm-hmm. And it's very normal just to have, you know, basically full time staff and, and a driver and a private driver. Yeah, yeah. But all my friends do. I mean, I have one helper. I have one assistant. I have lots of friends here who have two, three. I have I have a friend who has I think a cook, a maid, and a driver, and they just they live in an apartment. I mean, I think two of them live on site, and one comes and goes or something like that. But I mean, the apartments here are huge. Like mine is forty seven hundred square feet, so it's a big place, so we can handle this. We used to have a live in maid, but um, we got rid of her and um, and then just stuck with the assistant. But that's normal here, like most families who are well to do and like certainly not even rich i mean just just average will have help around the house so on on average how much would a full-time helper be what is the kind of the going rate yeah so a maid or a a cook or something like that will be about 450 dollars us a month and can kind of go up to about 550 I pay my assistant a thousand dollars. And do you do that just to be nice, or yeah. do, do you do that, you know, try to keep, you know, make sure he, you know, he sticks around, and he can afford his life? Well, both of those things. I mean, like I said, he's become part of the family, so I want to make sure he has enough money to take care of his wife and his kid. And I do like the loyalty. I want, you know, if I'm if he's going to learn my ways and the way that I want to do things, well, then I want him to stick around. I don't want it just like a couple of month thing, and then I have to find somebody else. And you know. An extra, what, $500 for me is not going to break the bank by any means. But for him, it means a lot, actually. You know, so, I mean, there's, there's multiple reasons that I would want to do that. Um, also, he's he's not, um, how to say, he doesn't just clean the house. Like, he's a, he's a, a strong man. So, I mean, if I need um, the toilet fixed or something, well, I don't want to do it. And I don't want to have to deal with getting a plumber. He's quite handy. He can take care of that. Or if I need pictures hung up on my house on the wall, I mean, he gets out the drill and he does it for me. Perfect. I mean, that just saved me half an hour or an hour was worth the time, which normally those responsibilities would fall to me. So for me, it's quite worth it to, to have someone like him helping. Yeah. I could, I could definitely see that. Uh, I'm lucky that the villa we rented comes with a full-time assistant as well. Actually, he, like, he doesn't live on, on site, but he's here you know, every day from like nine to five. And I told him like, you know what? Just, we don't need that much, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> like, if we need you, I'll, I'll call you, but you know, <laughs> just, you know, it just, you can go do your own thing and hang out. So uh, in Panama, how, what type of visa actually are you on? Yeah, so we do uh, a friendly nations visa. I actually help people do the friendly nations visa. And if um, you shoot me an email or go to escapeartist.com, you'll find the information on there. Um, but basically, it's a permanent residency visa. And I would argue it's probably the best visa in the world right now for residency. Um, you have to have, show some economic ties to the country. So we do that with a bank deposit and a company. So a company formation. Now, whether you actually ever use the company formation, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can let it go dormant. It doesn't matter. But then you open that, you open the bank account, you put $5,000 in, uh, pay the government fees, you visit the country, you provide some of the the standard documents like a criminal record check, you know, which has to be done on the national level, not on the municipal or state level. Um, It has to be done with fingerprints. You'll submit that, uh, Arnett size photos, an application, uh, some bank statements, proof of funds, things like that, and you can get this visa. And it allows you to live in the country, and you know, with one extra paper, you can work in the country. And I mean, actually work as in you could go get a job at a bar or um, get a job in an office or something like that. But if you just want to work from your laptop, I mean, you don't need anything special from that. And to keep the visa active, all you have to do is visit the country one day every two years. So you could always get it as a backup plan and then just keep it active. So if where you're living right now, something bad happens, things turn against you and you have a safe refuge refuge that you can go to. And Panama yeah. is a beautiful place, super safe, the zero tax country, like for, for our purposes, zero tax because they do a territorial tax system. So if you're earning your money online, you're a drop shipper or an Amazon FBA or a coach or consultant or any of t- those types of things. Tax-free country, zero tax, unbelievable. Yeah, we actually had heard really good things about Panama. Uh, it came up on the Invest Like a Boss podcast, my, my other podcast I co-host. 
uh, on episode 46 about you know the five flags or um, mm-hmm. the flag theory and it's it sounds like it really is one of the best uh, visas out there especially if someone wants to to be able to actually you know legally live uh, live somewhere outside their home country mm-hmm. uh, and they're they don't have um, the luxury of having citizenship by by nationality or something else or even yeah. citizenship by investment well absolutely and i mean you can you spend more than 183 days here you can be a tax resident here which is a tax free country so even if you travel other parts of the year i mean you can reduce your tax bill so much i mean there's some really strong benefits to not just being a digital nomad and constantly on the go I mean, having a tax residency somewhere else in a jurisdiction like this, massive benefits. Yeah, especially if you're not American. I think for Americans, it's a bit more- Even with America, even as an American, there's some big benefits. Because I mean, you can apply for the foreign earned income exclusion. You can Mm -hmm. earn your money online. You'd be a tax resident here. I'm not not giving individual tax advice by any means, but um, there's definitely strategies to reduce your tax bill considerably, even if you're American. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, for me, uh, I take advantage of the foreign earned income exclusion. But personally, I really like kind of just floating in the gray zone where yeah. I'm not, you know, you know, a legal resident really anywhere. I'm just a, you know, a tourist. Uh, and, and that's why I'm normally in places for less than six months at a time. Um, yeah. Sri Lanka is a bit different this year, but I'm just kind of moving around. But uh, my fear is that these loopholes are kind of going to close in the future. And they are. Then, the nice thing is there is um, these new you know, kind of digital nomad visas or remote worker visas popping up to replace it. But mm-hmm. I, I remember when somebody from the Thai government contacted me asking me, you know, what would the ideal digital nomad visa be? I, I thought about it for a few days and I got back to him and I, and I said, you know, if you, had, if you asked me a few years ago, I would have made a, a big list of, you know, things people would want. But honestly, just let us come on a six month tours visa and leave us alone. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I wish that we didn't have to do all these extra steps and we could just travel and things were easier. But you're right. Doors are closing all around us. But let, let's take an example. So you, I think you brought up Barbados earlier. And if my memory serves me correct, it's like two or $3,000 for digital nomad visa. And it's good for one year. Now, for roughly the same amount, maybe a little bit more, you can get a Panama Friendly Nations visa, permanent residency visa that's good forever. And after five years, you can actually apply for citizenship. You can go for naturalization and it's a tax-free country. So, I mean, you can spend one year in Barbados or you could spend as much time as you want for the rest of your life in Panama. And you get a company and a bank account here. You don't get in Barbados. Yeah, I I definitely like that. And I do remember that there are so many benefits of you know, kind of thinking long term. I, I think a lot of us digital nomads are thinking very short term. Where we're thinking, yeah, you know, you know, at least up until this year, places are pretty easy to go. You know, as long as we're moving around every two or three months, it's not a big deal. But as we get older, as people develop families, or they just get tired of moving around so often, it is nice to be able to legally. Uh, stay in another country and not have to go back to cold Canada in the winter. Absolutely. I have zero interest in that for sure. But I've, I've always done the residencies. I mean, I've had residencies in so many different places. And for me, like I said, it makes sense. But I mean, everybody finds their own path with travel. There's no right or wrong way. I mean, do what feels right for you. I mean, I do encourage people to try to make things official whenever you can. I mean, there's benefits. And once again, as you said, doors are closing. So it's like, you know, get these things while you can. I mean, lots of resident, like we're seeing all these digital nomad visas that are opening up, but at the same time, we see lots of residencies that are closing around the world or citizenship by investments that are finished. So it's like, scoop up the good ones while you can. Yeah, definitely. And even things like the foreign earned income exclusion, I have a feeling that, you know, I mean, it makes sense that we're, we don't have to pay as much tax. Uh, you know, we get this big tax break for not being in the country. We're not using the roads. We're not using these services. But I have a feeling that as more and more Americans move abroad and start working remotely, the government's going to get, get, maybe they're going to get a little bit greedy. <laughs> they're going to say, hey, um, let's close some of these, you know, these benefits because it's no longer the, you know, 0.001% of people who are forced to work overseas uh, for, a, you know, a, a company. These people are now choosing to do so. Yeah, absolutely. And think about, just this year, what's happened, like there's just a mass exodus of people leaving the US. 
Like you always hear in the mainstream media about all these people coming to the U.S. But the story is never told about how many people are leaving, like or how many people are giving up their U.S. citizenship. Literally every embassy around the world has a, a minimum of a six month waiting list for people trying to give up their U.S. citizenship and get rid of it. And the main reason is because of the tax obligations and FATCA. I mean, I don't want to get too much into the, the depth of the offshore and, and government programs and all these things. But I mean, you're right. Like, take advantage of this stuff now while you can. And because you don't know when it's going to change. Yeah, I like absolutely. I, I think things are only going to get more strict. And I keep telling people like right now, at least, you know, for the last five years, I've been talking about this has been a no brainer. I mean, I mean, just even uh, so, you know, using Americans as an example, just even taking advantage of the hundred and you know something thousand dollar uh, foreign earned income exclusion kind of tax credit, you know, and doing something simple like moving out of California or a high tax state to a, a zero tax state before uh, before moving abroad, that can save you thirty thousand dollars a year, and thirty thousand dollars can basically pay for all of your living expenses in many oh, countries, absolutely. including Thailand. So it's like basically like you know the government is paying you know basically paying you to live in a tropical paradise for a year, you know, or for the rest of, you know for the next you know however many years. And that money you can save and invest and that money will make you money in the future. I mean, that's basically my entire story, my path. And I feel like this was, I mean, it wasn't an old grandparents who couldn't work parents, you know, and this not be available in the future. Yeah, for sure. So you can add in, so you can look at the taxes, the savings on the state and on the federal level. Then we already talked about the cost of living in these countries. You have a really high standard of living and a really low cost of living. But let's add a couple of other things in there, reasons from the monetary side. Okay, look at insurance. I mean, for my family, we pay about $5,000 a year for private health insurance, and it's at a platinum level. We get dental, we get all the bells and whistles, all the extras, inpatient, outpatient, everything like that for 5K. I talk to my friends in the States, and they're like, yeah, we pay like $22,000 a year, and, and it's crap. We don't get anything with it. Like, wow, that's unbelievable. So, I mean, you can save ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars right off the bat from your insurance. And, you know, the, the next question I often get from people is, well, what about the quality or what about the standard? I'm like, five minutes from my house is a John Hopkins hospital. I mean, all the doctors are trained in Canada or the US. They all speak English. I mean, these they have brand new equipment. It's like this here, it's like this in Costa Rica. Lots of places in Latin America have really high level of service from the medical side and you can have insurance which is much lower and my insurance is actually worldwide insurance so i can basically go anywhere so as i travel i mean i don't have to pick up extra travel insurance or anything like that just my insurance that i have have here in panama covers how amazing is that yeah i when i when i add up all the money i've saved from health insurance these last 10 years uh, and and even things like car insurance i mean i i don't need a car in most of these countries because Things like private drivers are uh, cheap enough to have, or you know, tax taxis are easy, or I can live in a city center and just walk everywhere or drive a scooter. The money I've saved now from health insurance, uh, car insurance, and another huge bonus to be able to invest and build my net worth and have that money make me money in the future. Well, definitely. I mean, for me to go across town. It, um, in Panama in an Uber is anywhere from like $3.50 to maybe $4.50, $4.75. I mean, like I can take an Uber black for like five bucks. <laughs> Try doing that in New York or in LA or something. Yeah, it's insane. Like every time I go back to visit friends or family, I'm just shocked and appalled by the Uber prices. <laughs> and I just, sometimes I just refuse to do it just out of principle. I remember when I get to fly to LA and we hop in his Tesla and he drops me off kind of in, uh, uh, on, I think near Hollywood somewhere on his way back. Cause he was staying, uh, in Santa Monica or, uh, on the East, on the, on the West coast. And I was going to go stay with my cousin kind of towards the East. So he said, Oh, I'll just drop you here and you can just take an Uber. And I thought, Oh, great. That'll be easy. I checked the Uber price and it was like $80 to go, you know, uh, a 20 uh, minute drive. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm not paying any dollars for this. So I actually ended up going on the public bus, <laughs> you know, with my, my duffel bag, just getting off a private jet. 
just because I refuse to pay for an eighty dollar, you know, surcharge to uh, Uber out of principle. Yeah, not even that you can't afford it. It's just like this is this is not the right value. the 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 cost doesn't equal the benefit. So no, I get that for sure. I was in Vegas last month. Um, I was one of the speakers for a big offshore conference there, and I mean, we were staying. We weren't staying on the strip, but we wanted to go out for dinner and stuff at night down on the strip. And it was like $60 each way. I'm like, this is nuts. It's like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. And then dinner is another $100. And oh, you know, that exact same <laughs> quality of food and life could have been you know, a quarter of the price in Panama or in Asia or in many, you know, even in many places in Europe. Yeah. I mean, and on my podcast, when you were a guest, we discussed Eastern Europe and a bunch of those places and the amazing meals you had. And I definitely encourage people to go listen to that episode at expatmoneyshow.com. We had a good laugh on that one. And it's, it's nuts talking about all the different foods and how cheap it can be and, you know, get a bottle of wine for what, like four bucks or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, and it's a good life. So what kind of, what are you saying to ask you? And maybe sometimes it doesn't come up. Sorry, Johnny, you cut out there for a second. What was that? Yeah, no worries. Uh, let, let, me, let me just make a note and then repeat that. One, one second. Uh, the internet cut out for a second. So it was like, let me ask you. And then there was no, I couldn't hear any questions. So. Okay. Okay. No worries. Uh, so let me ask you, what, like, what are some of your favorite topics that you wish you know, people would, would ask you more, especially on interviews like this? Like, what is something that you really want to talk about and share with, with people? What is something that is valuable that doesn't come up enough? Wow, good question. I mean, I really enjoy all the residency and citizenship programs. I mean, that's kind of my bread and butter, what I do for a living. And just so people understand, like I work in the offshore space. I help people to either move themselves or move their money, their business, their wealth outside of Canada and the United States and help them move it to, you know, the Caribbean or in more tax favorable uh, situations. But the stuff that I really like geek out on is all these residency and citizenship programs. So, I mean, I don't know how many people you've had on your show to talk about by investment, but I mean, that's, a, I, I think is a cool topic. So what are, like, where are the places that right now uh, you can actually, you know, bake, I guess, buy your way into citizenship that actually still works? Yeah. So we work with Dominica, which has a big program there. They do a donation program, but they also do a real estate program which is pretty neat. They have one right now that I'm working with. We literally just started working with. Um, you buy into a hotel and with your payment, um, you actually become an owner of the hotel. You go to Europe and all over the place. It's a strong travel document as well. It's like 145 countries visa-free travel. And then you actually get a week stay at the hotel at this amazing resort in Dominica. And then there's also a piece of the profit sharing. It's, it's not a lot because, I mean, there's a lot of overhead expenses and you get your stay, but you actually get to earn a little bit of money. So you get something for your uh, in return, not just the passport. Because a lot of the programs we work with is just a straight donation. So it's citizenship by investment, but the investment is the passport. The investment is not like a return on capital. So we like Dominica at the moment. St. Lucia just had a really amazing one where they were doing... Well, they, they always do a bond for their citizenship by investment, but it was $500,000 originally. And then during coronavirus, they did like a, a COVID sale and they knocked it off by 50%. Ooh. So we were doing these um, citizenship by investments for $250,000. We did a ton of them. And yeah, it's like a five-year bond in the country. And um, it's a government bond. So it's rated triple B, which is like quite secure um, for these types of things. And since 1980s, the country since they started um, offering bonds, the country's never defaulted on the bonds because, uh, as my friend likes to say, I mean, you can default you can default exactly one time, and that's it because you'll never get another person mm. investing. So they do everything to make sure that there'll never be a problem. So the, these get paid back, but um, unfortunately, that discount's kind of uh, finished now. We'll finish by the end of the year. So, I mean, and that goes back to our subject earlier about doors closing. I mean, it's like I was pushing people, come on, take advantage of this. It's only going to be available for a few months. I mean, you're going to save yourself $250,000 right now. Move. So we, we did. We got a lot of people. But I mean, at this point, doors closed. So it's like, what other programs can we work with? So Dominica is a big one at the moment. Yeah. We still work with Portugal with their golden visa. Uh, we work with Vanuatu right now, which is a straight donation. That comes in at about one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars, and 
it's a good program as well. It's Vanuatu in the South Pacific is totally um, tax-free country, no capital gains tax, no inheritance tax, no wealth tax, no income tax, no corporate tax, no nothing. So, I mean, that's an amazing option. And then with the passport, you get access to the Schengen zone. You can go to Russia, you can go to the UK, you can go to Singapore and Hong Kong. So it's like really, really strong travel document. Um, so I like that one too. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, and so I've been when, to Vanuatu. It's a bond, beautiful like- there. It's like, and as a scuba diver, you would love it. I don't know if you've been or not, but they have some of the greatest wreck dives in the no. world. No. Yeah, I, I've barely even heard of the country. But yeah, it's basically I mean, like a that, thousand miles off the coast of Australia, um, out in the middle of the South Pacific, super remote. But it's like there's no cases of coronavirus, or at least last time I checked a couple of weeks ago, no cases of coronavirus. And at, at the moment, only residents and citizens can get into the country. And the cool thing is you can do your citizenship by investment completely remote. So it's it's wild. You do your oath of allegiance to get your passport and you can do it over Skype or Zoom. Like, that's hilarious. Mm. So you, you don't even have to visit the country and you can become a, a Vanuatu citizen. Yeah, I, I think during you know at least the 2020 COVID-19, most people aren't you know, uh, fearing for their, their life of you know, trying to get out of the U.S. or Canada uh, for uh, health reasons. But I can imagine a situation where either COVID-19 or some future pandemic, you know, really becomes, um, you know, has a high death rate. You know, like imagine if COVID-20 or something has a 25% uh, fatality mm-hmm. rate. I really think people are going to be lining up to, to buy their way into, you know, safe countries. Absolutely. I would add to that, though, that at least with COVID-19, the danger is not the virus. The danger is the economics. I mean, they're, they're just destroying countries. And I mean, civil unrest is, is real and is happening right now. And, you know, we started stockpiling food and water and petrol and stuff like that when all of this went down, because we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, I mean, were they going to close the grocery stores? Were they going to lock people in their homes? I mean, I'd like to go to a place where, okay, how are they going to close down the economy if they have zero cases? I mean, lots of countries are still fully open. There's lots of countries out there who have like 40 cases of the virus or, you know, like next to nothing. Um, and their country hasn't been yeah, ruined. I, I, the economy hasn't I, been, been ruined. Yeah, I, I've definitely been pretty fortunate being in, in Sri Lanka, but another country, you can only come uh, here if you're if you're a resident. So with the with the bond of places like St. Lucia, do those bonds actually pay any interest at all? Or do they just no, give you your money zero, back after, you know, X amount of zero, years? Sorry, another... There's like a two second delay. So that's why I keep talking over you. Sorry about that. I think it's just a delay in the internet. No worries. Okay. Yeah. So with these ones, these are zero interest coupon bonds. So it's basically a place that you, a safe place that you put your money for a couple of years. They use that and invest in an infrastructure and stuff, and then they pay it back in full. Now there's, there's some legal fees that need to be done on top of say the, in this example, it was a 250,000 during the sale or a $500,000 normally. There's other countries that do bonds like uh, Bulgaria does a citizenship by investment and it's a bond program if memory serves me correctly. And they're all zero interest coupon bonds. So it's, it's once again, the investment is really the passport. The investment is not a monetary return. Yeah, that makes sense. I do like the Dominica uh, scheme because it seems like you you know you get something back. Uh, is that also something that you can cash out after five years? And, yeah, so they and, have and like get a, your initial investment back. Yeah, so what they have is, I mean, and I'm going from memory here, but if you're selling it to someone else who is also doing a citizenship by investment, then you can sell it after three years. Then if it's just going to a normal investor. Um, it's five years. Actually, I think I have that in reverse. If it's, <laughs> sorry, it's uh, it's three years if it's going to a normal investor or it's five years if it's going to another person who's doing citizenship by investment. So there isn't a definite exit strategy for that. But a lot of people are buying in and holding it and you know turning a profit on it as well. And when you say that there is a small profit share, kind of what, what percentage would that be or how much would that actually be at the end of the year? Yeah, like I'm hesitant to say um, returns. I mean, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't 
I can't really give out financial advice. I mean, if you guys shoot me an email at escapeartist.com or on my podcast, expatmoneyshow.com, we can send you some projections and things like that. But I can't really say too much. It's not like a, it's not like a huge return. I mean, we're certainly not talking double digits or anything like that. Because once again, it's about the passport. Um, you look at some of the other programs and it's just straight donation. You give the government 100000 or 500000 or a million dollars and you get the passport. And Yeah, I definitely much prefer the the countries that allow you to you know, kind of get something for it. I think out of all the uh, invest, you know, citizenship by investment or residency by investment uh, schemes out there, I really like Portugal's golden visa. And I think the only downside to it that I've seen is – because of it, it's kind of driven up uh, uh, housing prices, especially in places like Lisbon. But in general, if you buy correctly, or maybe you buy in a different city outside of of, of Lisbon, uh, you can you know make a sound investment and actually be able to profit off of that uh, by re- renting it out or Airbnb or whatever it is. But also, you get your residency. Yeah, Portugal has an amazing program. I can flush out some of the details there. So basically, it's a five hundred thousand euro investment into real estate. But there's a couple of really neat things here. One is that it doesn't have to be a government approved project. It can literally be any real estate. With a lot of the other um, citizenship by investments, it's like, okay, you can do a investment in real estate, but it has to be approved by us. So then they like mark up the price like huge on these properties. So it's like, you, and a lot of times you're better off just doing the straight donation because if you try to sell it afterwards, there's going to be that, that delta between. But anyways, with Portugal, it's 500,000 euros. But if you do it outside of Lisbon or Porto or the Algarves, you can actually get a 20% discount. So it has to do with the amount of people per square mile or square kilometer. So if you're doing like out on the coast or if you're getting a farm or something like that, you can knock 20% off. So that's amazing. And then if the place is considered a heritage home, like it's over 30 years old and you're going to put a bit of money and restore it, you can knock another 20%. So you can actually do both of those at the same time. And I can't remember the exact math, but it comes in somewhere around a 320,000 euro investment uh, when it all is said and done. So actually, that's quite, inve- uh, it's quite um, affordable. And the neat thing is you can actually go in with other people and make the investment. So I don't mean that you guys can bundle your resources and put in each $35,000. But I mean, you guys can each put in $320,000 and buy a hotel or buy, you know, um, an apartment building, like an entire building with 10 or 20 apartments inside it. You can group capital together to do it. Um, And Portugal is a super, super strong country. It's very affordable there. It's still one of the most affordable places in Western Europe. They have a really high standard of living. And this does lead to citizenship. Portuguese citizenship is like certainly top 10, I think top six strongest passport in the world with like 180 or 182 countries visa-free travel worldwide. So, I mean, like this is the, the top of the top of the top tier A passport. And you can have it in five years through naturalization through the Golden Visa program. Yeah, I, I really like it. And that is probably the one I would personally, uh, I would go down that route if I wanted to get a citizenship, especially in you know the EU, uh, in the Schengen zone, which mm-hmm. is very powerful. Because as American, it's it's hard to stay in the EU or the Schengen zone for more than 90 days. And that's why I spend so much time in Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. in non-Schengen countries like Ukraine or in Georgia. But I would love to be able to spend you know six months of summer in you know Western Europe. Oh, definitely, this is this is as good as it gets. That's an unbelievable program, and we help a lot of our clients with it. I mean, there's other residencies and golden visas through Europe, but I mean, definitely Portugal is my favorite. Like they have one in Spain, but the taxes are crazy there. They have in Greece. They have in um, a bunch of other countries on the Mediterranean. Not a bunch. A couple of other countries in the Mediterranean. But I think Portugal is a really strong one. Montenegro is also coming up as a very strong one too, because the price point is very low. Um, so the way that one works is basically a hundred thousand dollar donation, and then it's like a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar real estate purchase. But instead of waiting five years for the citizenship, it's like three months. So you instantly become a citizen. Now the neat thing about um, Montenegro is at the moment they're not part of the EU, but they've already. Um, done their application and they're on 
uh, on course to become part of the EU and all the benefits that come with that within less than five years. And you know when that happens, I mean, the price of the golden visa is going to like double or triple. I mean, like it won't stay the same price. So, I mean, if you're thinking ahead, that's a great opportunity to get into the EU if you have a slightly longer time frame. So you, you get the citizenship now and it gets it's an OK passport. But in five years, it'll be like a really strong passport. So that's a good program, too. Yeah. And, and speaking of, you know, strong versus kind of um, I don't want to say necessarily just weak but more unstable uh, future of citizenships or passports you know there's i really like portugal because you know it is part of mainland you know of europe and if i was a betting person you know 10 20 30 years from now it's still going to be a you know a widely accepted passport and part of the schengen zone part of the eu versus some of these micro nations or you know caribbean uh, nations their passport Sports might not be as strong, you know, in five or ten years from now, especially if it's very easy to get the passport or second or citizenship through things like donation. Well, there's a lot of arguments both ways. Like I said, yeah, I definitely do like Portugal, but I do like some of the Caribbean ones as well. I mean, the fact that a lot of those countries are tax free, that they're considered offshore jurisdictions, they have really strong privacy laws and asset protection laws. I mean. There's a lot of things to consider. Like, I would never want someone to listen to this episode and then just run out there and buy, like, one of the things that I talked about without doing a lot of research. Like, there's a lot to this. What we do for a living, and I have lawyers and accountants who work for me and service providers who work for me, and, you know, we work with the clients on a boutique one-by-one -one basis and do consultations with them and, and flush out exactly what their needs are because everybody's needs are different. And it is good if, you know, someone comes in and be like, oh, I'm thinking about doing, you know, Portugal, or I'm thinking about doing um, Cyprus residency or a Malta citizenship or something like this. Um, but then we kind of look at it holistically on their overall objectives and what they need, and then try to help them find the best solution to that, because it might not be what the first thing that people think of. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it might, you know, maybe there's a solution from a country that they never even heard of that they can start exploring yeah I, I work with literally every country in the world although i don't really i don't do much with uh you know egypt or some of those countries i think they're pretty terrible programs i think it's a beautiful country but their citizenship by investment program is i mean i think they've only done 100 of them in the entire history of the program which hasn't been going for very long but i mean it's not not a very popular one the popular ones mm. are portugal cyprus malta bulgaria uh, Montenegro, all of the Caribbean countries, and now Vanuatu, which we talked about earlier, is coming, is the up and coming one, which is being really, really competitive with a lot of the Caribbean ones. So it's kind of cool. It's, it's also like what we talked about before with the governments competing for people to come and work there. They're also competing in this way on the citizenship by investment um, for the travel document. So, yeah, that's all good stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I can see that getting more and more popular. I remember the, one of the first times I've heard about citizenship by investment was when I read Neil Strauss's uh, book Emergency mm -hmm. back in you know 2009. I, I really enjoyed it. You know, really good book. He's a great writer. Whatever happened to Saint Kiss and Nevis and, and and their program, and, and as well as the passport? So I can't remember what the exact reasons were that they stopped that one. Um, I can't remember too much about that. We don't do anything with them. We do more St. Lucia, Dominica. Uh, those are the big ones that we do at the moment for the Caribbean. But um, yeah, some of the programs are around or and then finish or some of them are no longer as attractive as they once were. So we don't get a lot of business for them. But uh, I read that book as well. He's awesome. I like Neil Strauss. I'm on his email list and they're quite funny. Yeah, I, I haven't heard from him uh, in you know uh, quite a few years, probably more than five years. So I'd, I'd be curious what he's up to now, and uh, how that ma yeah. he runs a mastermind program for personal development now, and it's like an invitation only. And I think they, I took a couple of calls with them. They invited me to come on, but it was just I was had too much on the go. I was in another mastermind program in Chicago at the time, and too too much. But I, I think he's a smart guy, and he's done some unbelievable things in his life. I mean, he wrote all the autobiographies for like, I think he did 
Pamela Anderson's autobiography or no, maybe it was Jenna Jameson's or something like that. And then he went and did Marilyn Manson's and he did mm -hmm. all these wild auto, um, autobiographies and then he did Emergency and then he did The Game and I've read a ton of his books. He's a pretty wild individual. Yeah. And the Motley Crue one. Uh, yeah, the Motley Crue one. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I love it. So uh, we've all, you know, kind of lived our own rock style li lifestyles as kind of world travelers. I think we're very fortunate to have been born in this generation where we no longer have to be on a boat for six months just across the sea. And we have airplanes and we have opportunities. So I'm glad that you're taking advantage of it and you're enjoying the world. Uh, everyone listening, I hope that, you know, in 2021, as the world opens back up again, hopefully, uh, you are also going to travel and, and find your little niches. Uh, Michael, it's, it's been really great having you on the show. Uh, if people want to find out more, you know, get you, you know, find your book, get you know your website, how can they reach you? Yeah, absolutely. You can pick up my book on Amazon. I was quite fortunate and went to a number one bestseller. It's called Expat Secrets, How to Pay Zero Taxes, Live Overseas, and Make Giant Piles of Money. Super humble title, I know. That's, you know, super humble guy. <laughs> but um, grab that. Otherwise, check out my writing at escapeartist.com or subscribe to the podcast at expatmoneyshow.com. And we got tons of amazing episodes, tons of amazing guests, including you, Johnny. So I do encourage people to go and check that out. Yeah, it was, it was fun uh, being on that episode and it was fun chatting today. So thanks so much for you know dropping all this knowledge. I think there's a lot of nomads who are going to graduate to you know being a kind of a more of an expat. And this is good information for them to have either in the back of the mind, uh, you know, for the future, or maybe some of them are you know looking for this information now. Uh, if you know someone who is, share this episode with them. Take a screenshot, you know, however you want to to share it. Uh, but we'll see all of you guys next week. Mikel, enjoy Panama. Uh, enjoy some great food for me. And uh, hasta luego. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon, Johnny. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.